This is a pre-recorded rehearsal of Ken Mogi talk at TSG conference in Helsinki, 10th June 2015. I apologize in advance for any glitches as this is a live recording. The overflow model of the evolution of consciousness by Ken Mogi. There was this hit film, The Theory of Everything, which depicted the life and work of Stephen Hawking. However, I regret to say that this was not actually the theory of everything. The integration of the four host forces, gravity, electromagnetic field, weak and strong interactions, does not constitute a theory of everything. Because even if we completed a physical description of the universe, the problem of the origin of consciousness would still remain. Hard problems of consciousness, namely quarrier, self and free will, these needs to be resolved before we even claim that we have arrived at theory of everything. But how do we proceed? Well, let's take an inspiration from evolutionary biology. Here's a chronology of the life and work of Charles Darwin. In 1839, Darwin published Journal and Remarks, also known as The Voyage of the Vigo, in which he described what he experienced on the voyage on the Vigo. He was 30 years old. In 1859, two years after he received a letter from Alfred Russell Wells, Darwin published On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. Darwin was 50 years old. In this seminal work, Darwin established the basic concept of random mutation and natural selection as the driving force behind biological evolution. After the publication of The Origin of Species, there were further developments in evolutionary theory of biological systems. There was the rediscovery of Mendel's work. There was the classical genetics of Drosophila by Morgan. There was the genetical theory of natural selection developed by Fisher. And in the 1930s to 1940s, there was this modern evolutionary synthesis called Neo-Darwinism. And finally, in 1953, the double helical structure of DNA was discovered by Watson and Crick. So we can say that after The Origin of Species was published in 1859, it took almost a hundred years until the discovery of the structure of DNA, which is, of course, the genetic material of uh, all living systems. So when we are asking very fundamental questions like the origin of life or the origin of consciousness, we need to first develop fundamental ideas on the constraints and mechanisms involved, and then it would take more than a hundred years, typically, to develop the detailed mechanisms. And in the field of consciousness studies, we are still in need of the fundamental ideas. So what are the crucial constraints behind the evolution of consciousness? Well, here I'd like to conjecture that it is the sensory overflow. Sensory overflow has been always one of the most important constraints of living conditions. Imagine you are in a jungle. You are bombarded with sensory information. Uh, you would, this information would contain very valuable clues about the environment, about the food available, about potential mates, and the risks of predators. Your central nervous system would try to take advantage of this information. However, in general, it is not always possible to make unfair advantage of this information. In the membership program of consciousness, sometimes the importance of language is stressed so that some people claim that only humans are capable of having consciousness because of these linguistic limitations. However, from the point of view of sensory overflow, consciousness would be necessitated ubiquitously in all living forms, from the single cell to the brain. Because the sensory overflow is a common denominator for all living systems from the single cell to the brain. And if we adapt the view that consciousness is an emergent adaptation to 
this uh, condition, then we should say that consciousness is a continuous uh, process of evolution from the single cell to the brain. Although we do know that the human brain is the most advanced form of consciousness characterized by linguistic abilities as well. So in the overall model of consciousness, we deal with a wide range of biological systems from the single cell to the brain. And we take the view that consciousness is an adaptation to sensory overflow. But how does sensory overflow necessitate the emergence of consciousness? Well, we need to review the nature of overflow first. So a typical example of sensory overflow is vision. In vision, you seem to be seeing everything, but the cognitive and memory processes can register only a subset of what you appear to see. There are some empirical evidence for sensory overflow. Macan Rock, for example, reported inattention blindness in 1998. Simons and Levin reported change blindness in 1997. And if you include choice blindness in the sensory motor domain, in the sensory overflow, then uh, the report by Johansen et al. in 2005 is very relevant to sensory overflow. The cognition in the presence of a sensory overflow is generally speaking an ear post problem. So evolution of cognitive systems have been always at the best effort, leading finally to the emergence of consciousness uh, characterized by qualia and the self. So the key idea is that the adaptation to the presence of sensory overflow worked as an evolutionary pressure for consciousness to emerge. Now, it is important to distinguish between the physical overflow and the phenomenological overflow. Namely, physical overflow refers to the rudimentary fact that there is actually a massive chunk of self in sensory information bombarding biological systems from the single cell to the brain. Phenomenological overflow, on the other hand, refers to the massively parallel choreo in the story of consciousness, just as we are experiencing by observing this very beautiful piece of dandelion. So first, there would be the physical overflow as a common denominator for all biological systems. And then, the phenomenological overflow would emerge as an adaptation to this condition. This is the overflow model of the evolution of consciousness. But why was the emergence of phenomenological overflow necessary? We conjecture that it was necessary as a necessary condition for this perception. The bandwidth of represented information becomes narrower as we go higher up in the cognitive process towards consciousness. This is a visual system. The bandwidth of information processing is about 10 to the 10 bits per second at, as it enters the retina, 6 times 10 to the 6 uh, bits per second of information when it leaves the retina and 10 to the fourth bits per second of information reaching layer 4 of area we worm. And the bandwidth of consciousness has been estimated to be about 126 bits of information per second and just having a conversation takes about 40 bits of information per second. So summarizing this data, it would appear that information bandwidth in the video pathway from our vision to cognition gets narrower as you go higher up in the cognitive process and you approach consciousness. This narrow bandwidth in the conscious process in the presence of sensory overflow necessitates the perception of gist. And in fact, we are able to form gist perceptions if we, if we don't recognize and or forget the vast majority of what are in the sensory overflow. We forget the details, but remember the gist of it. Let's have a quick experiment and demonstration. A Milan display. Please take a look at this store display in Milan. Very beautiful, isn't it? Well, you feel as if you are seeing everything, right? But, well, I'm going to put a test to you. What was here? I bet most of you actually don't remember what exactly was here. It was a yellow star. Now, again, let's try. You feel as if you're seeing everything, 
in this picture, right? But again, what was here? I, I guess most of you cannot remember what it was. It was a red heart. So we, ha we have just demonstrated that you can't remember the details of the Milan display, but you do have formed the gist perception of it. Let's have a demonstration. Okay, here's just question one. Was the display A, colorful, or B, monotonous? Of course it was colorful, right? So here's this question number two. Was the display prayerful or subdued? Of course it was prayerful, right? Here's this question number three. Was the display A, fit for children, or B, fit for adults? Of course it was fit for children. So we have demonstrated that we forget the details, but remember the gist of it. And generally speaking, the gist perceptions serve as important basis for taking appropriate actions and increasing adaptation, then cognition and memory of details. So there's physical overflow in the first place, and under an adaptation, phenomenological overflow would emerge, and then, based on that, we would have gist perception, and then, based on this perception, we can take appropriate actions. But why was phenomenological overflow necessary in the first place? Was it not possible to form just perceptions without going through phenomenological overflow? In recent years, there have been increased interest in artificial intelligence. For example, in 1997, the human chess champion Kasparov was defeated by Deep Blue and IBM's artificial intelligence system Watson won in the quiz show Jeopardy against human champions. Ray Kurzweil discusses the concept of singularity in which artificial intelligence would take over and surplus human intelligence. They are having popular depictions of artificial intelligence in, for example, films like Her by Spike Jones, in which man falls in love with artificial intelligence. And Nick Bostrom discusses the existential risks uh, brought about by artificial intelligence in his book Super Intelligence. So all these interest in artificial intelligence brings up the question, is there shortcuts to this perception? In human brain, we have physical overflow, then there's this phenomenological overflow, and then we have this perception. But is it possible to bypass the phenomenological uh, overflow and go directly from big data to just perception? Well, in other words, is it possible to have intuitions without having consciousness? Is phenomenological overflow necessary? Well, this is really an open question, because otherwise we would have solved the hard problem consciousness. But we may make speculations now. Some statistical arguments have been suggested to account for the essence of cognition. For example, Horace Burrow discusses redundancy reduction as the first principle of perception, and Friston puts forward the free energy principle in order to explain the way the brain represents information about the environment in a statistically efficient and robust way. These statistical theories, for example, redundancy deduction or free energy principle, could account for the nature of the repertoire of Korea. The repertoire of Korea in this view in the phenomenological overflow would have evolved to represent the statistical nature of the physical overflow so that this suspicion can be formed efficiently. In this picture, there would be individuals in the world. Um, these individuals would be represented in the physical overflow. As an adaptation to the physical overflow, phenomenological overflow would emerge, in which the individuals are quarrier. The repertoire of these quarrier would be explained by statistical principles like the redundancy reduction or free energy principle. So basically, we can have this scenario of the emergence of quarrier and the phenomenological overflow in terms of statistical properties of the information. 
Here, it is useful to distinguish between two different categories of query. One is intentional query over one, and the other is sensory query. Let's go again. This is a biological motion, and you see a man walking. In terms of sensory query, it's just white dots in a black, black background. But we do interpret it as a man walking in terms of intentional query. Let's have another example. Here is a white grayscale uh, picture. In terms of sensory color, it is a distribution of grayscale color from white to black. In terms of intentional query, we interpret it uh, either as a young woman or an old woman. So the phenomenological overflow from this menu of sensory choir, on top of that, we have intentional choir as interpretations of the overflow. This is the basic architecture of our vision. So in over, the overflow model of the evolution of consciousness, the sensory and intentional choir play different roles. The sensory choir would constitute the phenomenological overflow, and they provide the basic repertoire of perceptual elements, and it is possible that the repertoire are basically genetically determined. The, this perception, on the other hand, are comprised of intentional choir. Intentional choir give models of the world in a flexible and semantically rich manner, and it is possible that intentional choir are modified through learning. Another interesting and open question is whether the this perception need to be implemented as intentional warrior in order to support and generate action, because some philosophers have suggested the, a close link between action and intentionality. This is a very open and speculative question, but it is worth pursuing. To conclude, in the overflow model of evolution of consciousness, the phenomenological overflow emerged as an adaptation to physical overflow. The phenomenological overflow is constrained statistically to serve as a basis for the efficient formation of this perception. And that is my talk. Thank you very much.